Hi, this is Paul. I wanted to give a little update on a friend of mine. And for those of you who are the praying kind, just ask your prayers for Daniel. I'm just going to read a little, a little piece that I just put on Twitter. I know those of you who listen to my channel a lot know that pastoring in this neighborhood has meant a lot of contact with and ministry to and with the homeless and the mentally ill. And this situation has been a situation that I've talked about throughout my time here. I'll maybe talk about it a little bit more directly today. I'll, ease, I'll just start with the tweets and sort of see where that goes. I've known Daniel for at least a decade now. He slept against my office door for about six years. Long history, some of you know it. Last spring, finally got a place in a residency program, which helped him keep medicated and mostly sober. Daniel... Well, I'll say some of his story. Daniel has an ex-wife and now four adult children. Um, his kids are probably about the age of my kids. Daniel is uh, three years older than I am, three and a half years older than I am, although he's got a good good amount of brown hair and a big, uh, big black salt and pepper beard underneath. Um, Daniel grew up in, grew up as a Mormon, lived in Utah, big family, good family. Um, I've, over the years, developed something of a relationship with his father. Um, his father's just a lovely man. And Daniel first came into the neighborhood because he came into a group home, a group home in the neighborhood. There are a lot of group homes in this neighborhood. Uh, gr people who run group homes look for houses with enough bedrooms so that they can put a fair number of people in and in a not very expensive part of town so that they can buy the home and still make a profit. And so for that reason, there are a lot of group homes in this neighborhood. Daniel first came to this neighborhood um, probably from, I don't know exactly how he landed in that group home, but he did. And he, Daniel, for many of the years that he was homeless here, would always tell me he didn't want to pay someone money to annoy him. And what he meant by that was to pay someone for a room and board would mean that 60 to 80 percent of his disability check would go to rent and at least a bit of crappy food. If you got a room and board, it's usually get the cheapest food possible, hot dogs, macaroni and cheese. And, um, and then he would basically try to moderate his bipolar with beer and sometimes harder alcohol, and sometimes pot, and sometimes harder street drugs. And so before we built the fence, he spent about five or six years sleeping literally against my office door. And, you know, there's a long run of building here, and I'd say, why are you sleeping against my office door? He says, because then you have to walk over me. And he would in order to try to supplement his disability check and because managing money as jordan peterson often says is very difficult he would um do a lot of recycling and he would do a lot of garbage picking and as sometimes happens, do a lot of garbage picking i've got pictures of just the whole line of the church being filled with garbage the treasures at one point there was a toilet up here against the church and this went on for a number of years, and basically I got very acquainted with his, um, his mood cycles. And when he was down, he would just huddle against the door. This was all the way going back to years when, I was, when my wife and I were homeschooling. She would teach school during the day. I would homeschool my kids during the day, and then I would come and work sort of afternoons and evenings at church because you tend to get a lot of church evenings. And I would, um, and even winter nights, I'd just hear him on the other side of my office door while I was writing sermons and such, just cursing and cursing his existence and wanting to die. But he's a, he's a very devout Mormon, and um, he doesn't believe that suicide would be right. That's part of it. Um, and so then I would sort of ride his cycles with him, and when he was in a manic phase, just encourage him to clean up, and he would clean up and be very proud of it and do a little bit of gardening on the site and be very proud of that and... But of course, he cycled fairly quickly, and so you know, on his way down, then we would hit all of the, and and round and round and round we would go with these kinds of things. Um, 
And this went on for about a number of years. Trouble would always happen when I would go away for vacation because when I was here, I would sort of manage him and the church sort of knew that I would manage him. But when I was away on vacation um, or out of town for a weekend, one of the members of the church who was cleaning up around the church started throwing away all the junk that he had accumulated here. And he was in a rather, he could get violent and he was in a rather violent mood and he attacked this member of the church. And um, he had had a long string of all little ticky tacky loitering, um, shoplifting, all those little things that really didn't get him into much trouble. But the member, the person that he attacked was, was, you know, about, was at that point in his, late 70s, early 80s, and so then it was, you know, it was a attack against a senior. So he went to jail for a year, and then he was in a locked facility for a year, and then when they let him out, there was a three-year restraining order that he wasn't supposed to come around the site. Um, that restraining order's now lapsed. I haven't told him. He still thinks it's in effect. Uh, he barely uh, followed it when he was here, but it was something that on a couple of occasions I could use to basically keep him separated from the people of the church. The Sunday, in fact, he strolled right in before church um, looking for me. And, um, and yeah, and the fence is built now, so he can't, um, he's not physically able to crawl over the fence or anything like that right now. So he's not going to be camping or sleeping on the site the way he did for all of those years. It's part of the reason we built the fence. We just had way too many homeless people who were, camping out on the site and I can sort of manage one or two but I can't manage five or six or eight and all of the things that come when you have more than one or two or five or six or eight so that's why we built the fence the church across the street is also now built a fence because when we built our fence a lot of our homeless people moved over there so it's you know the neighborhood is sort of hardening because of the inundation of the homeless and so yeah but last spring um a couple of weeks ago, he stopped by and said, yeah, I'm moving back into the neighborhood, back into the group home where I used to live. And I thought, uh-oh, I think history's going to repeat itself. He, um, about early this spring, he was able to get into this residency, residential halfway house type thing, which was a good thing because it curbed his use of street drugs. They helped um, keep him on his meds and... When he lived there, he'd stop by every now and then and we'd have a good chat and he was more or less dialed in. He was happy that he wasn't drinking because, again, he's a Mormon. He's got a lot of guilt about drinking, but, you know, he'd often tell me that he he uses, he doesn't abuse. He would also, um, he also, and part of the reason he has good disability and good insurance is that he worked, in fact, for county, um, worked for the county health care people for a while. I think he worked intake in a um, in a mental health facility, so he knows he knows all about the drugs. He knows all about the treatment. He knows all he knows <laughs> he knows all about all of these recovery programs because, in fact, he used to run them. He also used to run a couple of crack houses. He's just lived everything, and so he told me he was coming back, and I thought, uh oh, this isn't going to go well. Because the second time he came back, then he was smelling of beer, which meant that um, he was, in fact, trying to regulate himself via alcohol, which he's done for years. He would sort of drink enough beer just to sort of not get, feel too down and not get too up. And so alcohol would sort of try to stay in this sort of a, a buzzed, numb phase. Um, but, of course, that's, um, that's money. That's money. So, like many such group homes, they kick the residents out during the day, and I can understand that. So that's so he came to me Sunday and said, I can't be there when the guy isn't there. And so today he was here in my office and said, what time is it? I can't get back in until 4. And, and that's fairly common practice in some of these places, and it's totally understandable because the property owners, you know, their place might get burnt down, um, there might be violence. If they're not there to sort of keep tabs on everything and keep everything under control, it could get really bad. So they kick him out during the day, but for Daniel, that means now he's on the street. And now that he's on the street, it's going to be beer and pot and if not harder stuff and um, not knowing where to go. And, you know, he's been banned from most of the stores here in the neighborhood. 
So again, he found me today and um, smelled of alcohol, um, wanted to call his father. And his father, if he gets, if Daniel gets hard pressed, he'll call his father and his father will help him with a little bit of money. His father will mail it to the church and I'll give it to him and Daniel will try to make ends meet that way. Daniel's very conscientious. He, um, you know, when he, when he borrows money, he always pays back. Um, I mean, his credit is, his credit is amazing. He, for as poorly as he management manages money, he makes it a priority to, to pay his debts. And he's also very generous. He's been kicked out of most churches around here. Now he can't come to my church. He's a Mormon, so after the service, he would always give me a lesson of how my um, sermons were insufficient compared to Mormon standards. His father was a Sunday school teacher, and so Daniel knows his his Bible and his Mormon Bible fairly well, and he's got um, books verses out of the Book of Mormon memorized. And so he used to like coming to church, but then, of course, after the assault, um, isn't really isn't really fair. He's been kicked out of most of the Mormon churches in the neighborhood. So once the old street habits return, he's back to street drugs, which disrupt his psych meds and that attempt to regulate his bipolar and the beer and the pot costs money and he has less of it because he's paying rent. And so I wouldn't be surprised if he's either gets, he's only been in there now. It's December 7. He started December 1 and things are already rocky. I don't think he'll last the month. I think he'll be homeless by the end of the month. It's it's almost certain that in the next few days he'll come to me, he'll be despondent, he'll be he'll have suicidal ideation and he'll be and I'll be driving him to the ER and the whole thing will start again. Now maybe the system will intercept it and send him back into a residency unit that has a level of supervision and some ability to help him with his meds. What's so difficult with so many of these individuals is that it's you, you need just the right amount of support. And, and even that level of support varies month to month or day to day. They'll have a good day and they don't need a lot of support. They have a bad day and they'll need more support. They'll need more attention. They'll need... You know, I, I really like you know, what how, what Jordan Peterson has been talking about lately in terms of sanity, because so often what happens is that, you know, when I sit down with people, I, I lend my sanity to them. And it's always limited, and, and there's only so much you can do. That's what I do. I lend my sanity to them. And if they're depressed, I lend some of my buoyancy to them. And, you know... I always, you know, now, it's easier now that he has a reliable access to a shower. You know, I always give him a hug. I always put my arm around him. I always tell him I love him. You know, he's, he's over the years, he's threatened my life how many times when he was in certain moods. But, um, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Lend him some of my sanity. Lend him some of my agency. Sometimes give him a ride, sometimes help him out with this or that. Today I helped him call his father. When he called his father, his father said, I'm in the hospital right now, we'll be for another seven days. His mother passed away a number of months ago. He and I did a lot of processing of that. Now that he's, now that he's almost, almost 63, his short-term memory is going, um, He's not, he's not as quick. The stories are repeating themselves more. He can't tolerate the homeless lifestyle as much anymore, and he knows it. He's now more vulnerable to physical violence on the street. He's still pretty strong. So he calls his dad, and, he, you know, Pastor Paul, can I call my dad? Yeah, I call his dad. His dad didn't have a pencil. Tough time remembering. I can't write anything down can't remember it. Okay, I'll text you. I'll text you my address and number so you'll have it. Oh, I don't do texts. Well, it's in your phone. Ask one of your kids to find it in there. Probably his father's having some pretty significant medical things. His father, I think, is 92 or 93. Wants to help his son. Loves his son. I'm amazed at the patience that he has with his son because, of course, Daniel's had this bipolar, I'm sure, most of his life. 
I've had some conversations with extended family members over the years. I've met at least one of his children. He's a human being. Daniel's bipolar isn't under control right now. And when he seeks me out, I hear the same old patterns. Over the last couple of months, he's been in the ER at least once a month, and I take and sometimes take him directly to the psych ward. I almost drove him there today, but he didn't want to go because he knows if he does go, it might disrupt his current housing situation, and he worries about theft, losing his spot, etc. People see homeless situations in the news, but when you get down to it, the, every individual, it's a rough situation. And... You know, I applaud state, county, city officials. They, you know, you try to do programs. You try to, you try to do what you can. Um, and hey, you know, if not for his disability check, the room and boards. I mean, all of these, all of these measures that are insufficient are at least partially sufficient for some things. And and certainly, we all want and would love to have a better treatment. And, you know, I follow Michael, Michael Schellenberger on Twitter and I've read some of his stuff and at least he seemed to have more of a realistic view of some of this because when you get down to dealing with them as individuals and you sort of peel away sometimes all of sort of the surfacey benevolence posturing, it's just, it's just hard. And any, anyone who deals with a family member with schizophrenia or bipolar or alcoholism or substance abuse knows it's hard and, he, and even those and we've got some in this little corner who are you know maintaining sobriety through their 12-step program through their recovery programs um you know and these are these are heroes for me because it's they're they're doing they're doing the right thing and they're living it but there are others who who deal with mental illness that i have a cousin who is you know, he's been through detox maybe 10 times. He's been through recovery periods 10 times. Um, you know, continues to live this life. Not here in California, in Michigan where it's cold. I think he's now in Florida, actually. So many of you I know from your comments have someone like this in your home. And you know the drill and you know the story and you know the, the long-suffering. And, and some of you have had to put out friends and family members and I'm sure there's some of you that have family members who are homeless and you know it's it's awfully nice to give a handout or give a pair of shoes or give food or all of that and you know sometimes it's needed and necessary it's so often it's it's insufficient and sometimes helping hurts it's so complex but again as I said before for those of you who are praying people, just pray for Daniel. And um, like I said, I fully expect that by New Year's he'll be kicked out of his new place and he'll be homeless again. And I'll probably try once again to bring him to the ER and run him through that system. And maybe again that system will... I basically was running him through the ER repeatedly because I had no other options through the ER and the psych hospital. And I figured at some point, someone's going to get tired of this revolving door and grab him into a better system. And that's what happened. And the system helped for a little while. but So maybe this is a bigger loop that will work until... You know, I've worked with some of these guys. And, and, and for some of them, it doesn't stop until they get weak enough to get into basically a Medicaid nursing home. There's an unmedicated paranoid schizophrenic that I helped for a while. He was living in a house right down the road. His, it was the house he grew up in. His parents, when they died, put it in a, put it in a trust for him. His sisters helped him out. A couple of guys on parole moved into the house. They would basically, you know, his sisters would, would put food in the fridge and these guys would give him beer and drugs and they'd squat in the house and they'd keep him in fear. And then they basically, he ran from the house and he was living in a shed on the church property for a while without my permission. 
Um, eventually, I worked with the sisters, got the got the got the felons out of the house with the help of the sheriff. Got him back in the house, and he burned the house down. In and out of a variety of other living situations, I finally got him into a situation, which amazingly it worked for a couple of years until he got hit by a truck, which put him in a hospital, put him in a nursing home in another town, another city not too far from here, and that's where he's been ever since, and that seems okay. Some of these guys... I don't hear about them until I hear that they're dead. I watched my father do this for years. In some ways, this kind of ministry is a privilege. You do develop relationships with these guys. <laughs> it's really hard for the women. So most of the guys I know are guys. You do develop relationships with these guys and you do care about them. But there's often not a lot you can do. So, yeah, so just prayers for Daniel. And um, and I know from making, from telling these stories that there are a number of you who are out there living this life. You've got people in your house, you've got kids, you've got parents, you've got siblings. And, um, yeah, my prayers are for you too.